You ever think about that concept, faithfulness? Something being faithful, something that is true, something that's reliable, something you can trust. In our society, America 2018, we see that everywhere, right? Faithfulness everywhere. No. We live in a society in decline. I've been telling people for years, if you want to see what America is going to look like in a few years, just look across the pond to Europe. And they are a society that's in decline. Decline in faithfulness, decline in truth, decline in anything biblical, anything um, to do with God and the Bible. So in our society, when we see an example of faithfulness, we're like, wow, look at that. They're married for 50 years. That's amazing. They didn't divorce. Barbara Bush just died. Her and George H.W. were married for over 70 years. He was her first kiss, her first boyfriend. They were together for 70 years. And that's, that's unheard of just for the longevity. But the faithfulness, they stayed together, husband and wife, for 70 years. And should that be a big deal? <laughs> But then we all promise till death do us part? We all promise that, right? Amen. People in Hollywood that go to the aisle, they promise till death do us part, don't they? Uh, yeah, maybe not anymore. <laughs> till inconvenience comes and we shall consciously uncouple. Did you ever hear that one? One of those Hollywood stars says they didn't call it divorcing. They said we are consciously uncoupling. But we don't have faithfulness, faithfulness in our major institutions in this country. We don't see things that are true and reliable and trusted. We were, I was talking about a conversation with an accountant. We'll get there. Don't get ahead of me. You know, I was talking about a conversation with an accountant. People my age, we don't plan on Social Security being around when it comes time for us to retire. We don't trust it. That's you either. Yeah. Really? Okay, maybe it's just a, a generational age thing, but you know, you just see what's going on. You can't trust it. You have politicians. I'm going to elect my guy and send him to Washington, and he's going to do exactly what he said, right? No. <laughs> we can trust the media, can't we? We can trust our news. And everything's true on the internet. We can trust that. Our schools. We can't trust our schools. They're not faithful. Can you think of one in major institution in our country anymore that is, you can say, that's faithful? That's true? That's reliable? That they're going to do what they said they were going to do? What's happening is our society, our culture, we're crying out for a biblical truth, and we don't even know it. We're looking for somebody to stand up and let their yay be yay and their nay be nay. We're looking for somebody to be faithful. It's like Charlie Brown, the great theologian Charlie Brown. Isn't there anybody here that can be faithful? Isn't there anywhere I can look for truth, for faithfulness? You see it even, you know, we're talking about the big institutions in our country. You see it even in your own life. You go to your job, boss says, hey, Johnson, you're going to get a raise this time. After this, you're going to get a raise. And then the time for the raise comes around, what happens? Well, we've had some things come up. But we've had, you, you promised me. No raise. You can't trust him. He's not faithful. Your commission check will be in by Friday, Johnson. Oh, there's been a delay at the bank. Hmm. What about your friends? You look around your circle of friends, it's just st easy for me to say, statistically speaking, half of them are going to be divorced. Their marriages aren't going to work out. One of them will be unfaithful. Your friends, you find out, are spreading gossip about you behind your back on Facebook. That's always a fun day, right? 
Okay, well, not my job, not my friends. Well, at least I have my family. Oh, you have problems in your family, too. Unfaithfulness in your family. Unfaithful in their business dealings. Nobody ever lies, do they? The easiest way to spot a liar, I know I've told you this before, the easiest way to spot a liar is to walk to the closest mirror. You lie, why don't you think everybody else does? Well, at least I have faithfulness in my marriage. Well, not for 50% of people, right? So top to bottom, you look at the big institutions in society all the way down to my family, my marriage. I can't find faithfulness. I can't find something that's true, that's reliable. But wait, isn't there something in the Bible about where I can find truth and faithfulness? 1 Timothy 3.15 1 Timothy 3.15. Look at the last part of the verse. 1 Timothy 3.15. 1 Timothy 3.15. The church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So I'm looking for some kind of faithfulness. I'm looking for some kind of reliability and truth. I will go to church. That's where I will find faithfulness, reliability, truth. I'm going to church. What do I find when I go to the pillar in the ground of truth? You find people that have been let down. Well, preacher told me if I just kept tithing right and giving my money that God wouldn't let my family member die of cancer. That he died. What preacher said wasn't faithful, was it? It wasn't reliable. Preacher told me if I just gave my faith promise. Does everybody know what a faith promise is? This is the kind of thing that can only go on in church. You don't have the money right now to give the money you want to give to the church. But you promise... <coughs> I'm going to give that money that I don't have. By faith believing that God's going to give me that money. So essentially church is teaching you to make bad financial decisions for your family. But what happens? They promise you if you give that faith promise while you just watch out, God's going to bless your business. Well, I just had the worst quarter I've had in 10 years. After I gave money that I didn't have. It wasn't reliable. It wasn't trustworthy. You were hearing things from what was supposed to be the pillar and the ground of truth that were not reliable. The pillar and the ground of truth. We look at the pillar and the ground of truth, we see Jimmy Baker. He's back. <laughs> he was gone for a while, now he's back. Remember Ted Haggard? The pillar in the ground of truth. You turn on the pillar in the ground of truth on TV and you see a man begging for money so he can buy a brand new Gulfstream jet. Yes. <laughs> but we're supposed to be the pillar in the ground of truth and it's scandal after scandal unfulfilled promise after unfulfilled promise and people are getting disillusioned. So we're starving to, for something that, to hold on to that's faithful, that's true. Okay, well I can't trust society. I can't trust my relationships, my family completely. I, I can't trust just going to any which church and whatever they say. I can't trust that. What can I trust? You held it up a little bit ago. Hmm. Well, there's that Bible thing. There's that. Another way I know all of you are liars in here. Forgot to mention. How many of you this week clicked, I have read all the terms and conditions and agree to them? <laughs> you did, didn't you? I did. 
I had one that actually made you scroll through the text. I'm like, oh, that's stupid. I gotta scroll all the way to the bottom. Uh, the Bible is God's word. Is there something in the Bible about the Bible saying that it's faithful and true? There's a verse in there somewhere, isn't there? Psalm 12, the words of the Lord are pure words. God will preserve them for this generation forever. So you say, okay, I'm going to look to the Bible for truth, reliability, and trustworthiness. And your friends look at you like, come on, man. This is the 21st century. Floating axe heads, really? Seven days of creation, really? We have science. What about a talking donkey? Anybody remember that one? Yeah. You tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor. That is one of the funniest parts of the Bible. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> He'll be here all week, folks. Tip your waitress. <laughs> But seriously, you, we live in an age where you believe in an actual virgin birth. Do you? You read these accounts of supernatural healing. We were talking about on Thursday, a guy lame from birth. Legs have never worked. The man doesn't, not only can he not walk, he doesn't know how. He's never learned. He's never walked once in his life. Two seconds after Jesus heals him, he's walking around carrying stuff. You believe in that? We talked about also the maps in the back of your Bible. Take a look at the map of the Exodus in the back of your Bible. I have never seen a Bible map that has the children of Israel walking across the Red Sea. You see them going all over the place. There's never a map that has that dotted line that goes through the Red Sea. But you talk to somebody in our society and say, I'm looking for the Bible for truth. And they say, really? You think the walls of water piled up and they walk through on dry land? Really? So our society not only is not trustworthy, our society will fight you and tell you, you can't trust the Bible, that's an old book of fables. That's an old book of stories. We don't need that anymore. So, I'm going to go to a place where people believe the Bible, and people say amen to things like floating axe heads. <laughs> so then you go and you listen to the pastor and the priest say, open the word of God. They usually say it like that. The word of God. And then for the next 30 minutes of his homily, he, he corrects the Bible and tells you where all these mistakes are. Says, oh, what an unfortunate rendering that is. Oh, that's a mistake there. Now what are you going to do? I can't trust my institutions and my society. I can't trust these smaller things. Churches are kind of let me down, but I try to trust, trust the Bible, but now the guy in church is telling me not to trust the Bible. I'm betting my never dying soul on these words. I need them to be right. But slowly and, but surely, you have a thought creeping into your head of when I'm looking for faithfulness, I got nothing. If I've got all the way down to the Bible, and they're telling me I can't trust the Bible. You wonder why so many people are quitting. Church attendance is going down and down and down every year. You, you see a small microcosm up there on Arlington Street. There are two or three new businesses there that weren't there before. How did they get there? They bulldozed the churches that used to be there. We don't need them anymore. Can God lie? He says he can't. People say, God can do anything. No, he can't. He can't lie. He says that in Titus 1, 2. God cannot lie. 
If he did, he would be a sinner and he would cease to be God. He cannot lie. He promised he would preserve his words for us in Psalm 12, 6 and 7. So we need to make a faith choice that we're going to believe the words that we have. And when we look for faithfulness, our Bible actually has some, some good instructions on things where I can hold on to this. This is faithful. I can bank on this. I can trust this. There are four faithful sayings that Paul talks about. The first one, you're in 1 Timothy already. Just turn back to chapter 1. Where can I find faithfulness anywhere? Look at the first words of the verse. This is a faithful saying. Hallelujah. Amen. My God says he can't lie. He says he's going to preserve his words. I'm reading his words and he says this is a faithful saying. And worthy of how much acceptation? All. All. You, me, we're part of the all. This is worthy of your acceptation. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save good, pious, religious people. Oh, yours doesn't say that? Christ Jesus came in the, into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Paul's talking there. That's chief as in how. I'm chief. You can't say that anymore, can you? That was probably cultural appropriation. Sorry. Yeah. He calls himself the chief of sinners. He calls us his, our apostle and our pattern. People look at Jesus Christ and the life of his life and say, well, Christ just came to show us how to live a godly life and do better. And that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to do better, live right, follow Jesus. I got news for you. He's God in the flesh. You can't keep up. He is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. How are you going to keep up with that? Christ lived the perfect life for me. For you. You can't have a sinner on that cross. You're telling me a sinner is going to satisfy God's justice? You have an eternal, holy, righteous God that you owe a big debt to. The only one that can pay that debt is an eternal, holy, righteous God in the flesh living a perfect life and dying as a substitutionary atonement for you. Christ Jesus came to save sinners. Sinning, or saving sinners is not religion. The definition of religion is a system of works or activities whereby you gain God's favor or assuage his wrath. That's the definition of religion. All the favor you need from God was earned for you by Christ assuaging his wrath for you. If you're going to be saved, you need to admit that you're a sinner. That's why it's so hard for religious people to be saved. They're not trusting Christ. They are trusting their own works, their own religion. Ask somebody to describe their religion to you. When they're done talking, say, well, I just heard you describe something that does not contain the gospel. I asked you to tell me why you're saved. Everything you said to me did not contain the one thing that I needed to hear. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. 
Brethren, I declare unto you the gospel by which ye are saved. What is it? Go to church, pay money, do good works, show up on work days. That's very important. No. Yeah, all that. You're here. The gospel, that's what's so wonderful about the gospel. When you read it, Christ died, he was buried, he rose again the third day. What's great about that? I'm not involved. I can't mess it up. I need to Ephesians 1.13, hear it, believe it, and trust it, and then he will seal me to the day of redemption. <clears throat> Glory, I can't mess that up. The work's been done. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. I can be saved. I am a filthy, rotten sinner. But I can be saved. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Do you realize in our society now that is hate speech? Yeah. Calling somebody's preferred activities and what they like to do sin? <gasps> That's hate speech. Save me from what? I'm perfect. My daddy told me that. You're a sinner. That's why it's so hard for people to get saved is they don't want to admit they're a sinner. All have come short, have they not? God graciously provides a way for filthy, rotten sinners to be saved, and we look back at him and say, you're a bigot. That's hateful. You're not accepting. Save me. Save me from what? It's hard. That is our mission field, folks. That is who we are called to preach the gospel to. Christ Jesus can't save a sinner if the sinner won't admit that there's a God. And if the sinner won't admit that they are a sinner, they need to see that. God, Christ said, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends, right? He said that to Israel when he was ministering to Israel. He proved that he was more than just a man. He proved that he was the God-man when he revealed I died also for my enemies. That's greater love, isn't it? That's greater love than a man. The God-man also died for his enemies. Reconciling his enemies. That's, that's something that it was new when Paul showed up. Up until Paul shows up, you see Christ coming to who? His friends. He came unto his own. You believe me? You follow me? Great. Then you see him show up to his worst enemy. Up until then he'd been saying, Woe to you, Pharisees! Woe to you, enemies! Woe to you! Woe to you! All of a sudden he shows up and says, I'm going to save you, my biggest enemy? What is going on? He says, Paul says, Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe to, on him to life everlasting. You want to talk about long suffering. We were talking about this in one of our Thursday meetings. Here you have God all through human history. Here you go, Adam. Here's one rule. King of the world, I rule. Break it. Okay, moving on. Oh, the whole earth is full of violence and corrupt. Flood it. Okay, eight people left. We're starting over, guys. Here's what I want you to do. Spread out. Stay away from each other. Spread out over the face of the earth. What do they do? We're going to stay in one place and build a city. Then he looks down at all the nations. They're all a mess. Okay, I'm going to start a new nation with this guy, Abraham. 
And that'll be my nation. How did the Old Testament work out? It was all hunky-dory, right? Israel said in Exodus 19, all that you say will do. Biggest lie in the Bible. Okay, well I'm finally going to send the prophesied Messiah to my nation, who I've been telling for thousands of years, this Messiah's coming. Here he is, guys. Crucify him! Give us Barabbas! If I were God, the next thing I dispensed from heaven would not be grace. Lightning bolts, thunder, and wrath. But God proving his long suffering and his grace says in response to that, I'm going to dispense more grace. I'm going to save my biggest enemy and make him a pattern. Be glad I'm not God, right? Amen. Amen. Glad you aren't either. <laughs> I was too fast on the amens. <laughs> Salvation is not a process. Salvation is an event. Ephesians 1.13, you hear the gospel. You believe it. You trust it. God saves you. Sealed until the day of redemption. So the faithful saying, number one, I can trust the gospel. I can trust Christ. Well, that's one thing. Faithful saying number two, you're still in 1 Timothy, look over at chapter 4. First, uh, let's start in verse 7. But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having the promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. The Bible is being hard on old wives there. We know that something that never exists. You never tell your wife she's old, so... <laughs> Kidding. Old wives' fables. Fables. You, you know, everybody's heard a story passed on from generation, a silly story that everybody believes is true. Here's an old wives' fable for you. Anybody ever hear about burying St. Joseph? You have? Uh huh. If you want to sell your house fast, go buy a statue of St. Joseph. Bury him in your lawn. No, side note, if you have a condominium, it's best to buy a pot and bury him in the pot. I'm not making this up. Bury this, but not just any which way. You have to bury him upside down with his face looking at your house near the for sale sign. Then your house will sell fast and you'll get your asking price. <laughs> that was not on the instructions. We'll, we'll talk about it later. That's an old wives' fable. Well, five generations of my house and my family all believed that. We all went to that denomination. That's what they all believed. <laughs> Happenstance, circumstantial. Correlation does not prove causation. I didn't do it. No, that's <laughs> silliness. I set my, I put up a fair asking price and I got it. It's a miracle. I'm taking this thing with me. 
What's a favor? <laughs> you guys are rowdy this morning. <laughs> What's a fable? Is it something that I can look at as faithful, true, and reliable? A feigned story or tell. Feigned, that's a fancy word for fake. Intended to instru instruct or amuse. A fictitious narration intended to enforce some youthful truth or precept. Oh, so telling lies in order to help truth. That's what a fable is. All right. If it's a fable, it's not truth. In 2 Timothy 4.4, 4, Paul's warning Timothy about people that will turn their ears away from the truth to fables. Truth is the opposite of fables. Let's move on here quickly. I'm getting long-winded. Bodily exercise profits little. Everybody who hates going to the gym knows that. Helps a little. Keeps your carcass going a little bit longer while we're here sucking air and doing our job as ambassadors. Whoa. Stink bug. I don't know. <laughs> Just let him go about his business. Godliness is profitable unto all things, having the promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. Did you know we're told we have to walk by faith and not by sight? That's different than, say, Old Testament Israel, right? They're literally following by sight, following the pillar of smoke and the pillar of fire. They're walking by sight. We're told we have to walk by faith, not by sight. You have to walk by faith to hold on to the truth of that. Godliness is profitable. The truth about godliness when you live in a present evil world can sometimes be hard. I started living godly and now everything's going great. Everybody loves me that much more. Everything's wonderful. No? Well, you must not be doing it right. Hmm, since I started living a godly life, half of my family doesn't talk to me anymore. They don't want to hear about that Jesus junk and that Bible stuff. Hmm. Don't get invited to the social functions you used to get invited to, do you? Hmm. I started trying to be godly, and it's cost me a bunch of money. Why? Well, one, you stopped lying on your tax returns. <laughs> and two, you stopped cheating in business. Because you're like, well, I'm a new creature in Christ. I'm saved. I need to be acting like who God has made me in Christ Jesus. And a saved person shouldn't be stealing. But it cost me a lot of money. How is that profitable? Hmm. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and even are willing, rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. Amen. That's the key to understanding how godliness is profitable. It's not you. It's not me. It's us in Him. He's the one I need to be acceptable to. He's the one that I need to be godly for. It's not about my bank account. It's not about my friends list on Facebook. It's about Christ his gospel, his work. The verse in Timothy said, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come, when your attitude towards both meet, the life that now is, we're in North Canton, living in sin-cursed flesh having a war in our members every day, the flesh against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. Is it going to be that way in the world that is to come? 
When your attitude towards the life that now is matches your attitude for the life that is to come, that's when you're getting into godliness. Godliness. Anybody ever read Colossians 3? Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. That's another thing you got to do by faith. Anybody been above? I love it up there. You have to believe it by faith. What's above? My Savior. Thank you, Lord. You've saved me. Start there. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Why, Paul? For ye are dead. Ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. God looks at this pile of flesh that I live in and sees it as dead and buried. Amen. I need this pile of sinful flesh dead and buried. Why? Because it's a pile of sinful flesh. I need to be cut loose from that. That's what God does by the power of the gospel. I'm Colossians 2.10, complete in Christ. That's a good place to be. Complete in Christ, not me being wonderful, not my so complete in my social circle, not complete in my family, not complete in all of our institutions. I'm complete in the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So godliness is profitable. It's profitable in the life that now is and what is to come. What we need to do is understand that the profit we're thinking about is not the profit that a godly person would be thinking about. How's that? Souls saved, saints edified for the glory of God. Look over at chapter 6 in 1 Timothy real quick, and then we'll move on. Godliness. 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Anybody doing well on that verse this week? I've just been content all week. I had food and clothes, and I didn't think about anything that I don't have or want. There is only one thing we can take with us. People. Souls. Why does he focus so much on the gospel? Why does he focus so much on this? It's the only thing we can take with us. People. Let's look at, I'll move on here, number three. Still in the Timothys, look over at 2 Timothy, chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 11. It is a faithful saying. Third thing I can hold on to. I can grab on to this. I know that I can hold on to Christ coming to save sinners. That's faithful. I know that godliness is profitable even if it doesn't look like it. I can hold on to that. Third thing, it is a faithful saying. For if we be dead with him, we shall, shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he, will also, or he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. And you are complete in him. Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. 
Now, I understand we preach salvation by grace through faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ alone. And this section of scripture is used as a club by people who try to teach you to trust your works for salvation. If you look at the context, Paul is talking about how we're going to get saved people in eternal glory. He's not talking about you losing your salvation. But look at the promise. If we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. Do you understand what a change that is? There was a time in your Bible, you can read it in Deuteronomy, if you're suffering, if you're having a bad day, if things are going wrong, that's judgment from God on your life. That's a promise. Read it in Deuteronomy. It starts off with, if you do this, it's blessed in the field, blessed in the storehouse, blessed coming in, blessed going out, blessing your socks off. And if you do wrong and you do bad things and you don't keep the words of this covenant, cursed it in the city, cursed it in the store, cursed it coming in, cursed it going out, cursed be the fruit of thy body, sixty some verses of curses. What God is telling us, members of the church, the body of Christ, is we are not to look at our circumstances as proof of our standing with God. You're an ambassador from God's heaven to a planet that follows the course of the God of this world, which is the devil, populated by seven billion people who hate God. You're going to have bad days. You can bank on that. You can, there's another faithful saying. <laughs> that's not Bible. That's Steve, though. But your standing with God is you are dead. If we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. That's a wonderful thing, to be dead. That means it's done. It's finished. He's done with that old man. I am now complete in Christ. Romans 6 says, If you've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. In God's eyes, he looks at my flesh as already dead. It's, it's a judicial choice made by God. I understand I'm still here sucking air and this body is still alive. But in God's eyes, that's dead. That's destroyed. That's gone. For he, why? Verse 7 in Romans 6, for he that is dead is freed from sin. I'm free from it. I'm cut loose. Another verse, if you want to look it up later, we'll skip it for time, is in Colossians 2.11, talking about the circumcision made without hands. He's literally cut my soul and spirit loose from that sinful body. If we suffer, we shall reign with him. How can I suffer? The easiest way to start suffering is follow point two. <laughs> Start being godly. I have a promise for that. It's also in Timothy. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. They didn't tell you that when you got to the aisle down front, did they? Sign the card, move right over here, we'll start your persecution. Godliness training. Come on down. Preacher hasn't been getting many people down front lately. Hmm. All that shall, will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. We need to know that when you read books like Deuteronomy. It said over here, be a good boy and I get my socks blessed off. Well, you're not under the Old Testament. You're not Israel. You're a member of the church, the body of Christ, if you're saved, and your precious Bible promise is, be godly and suffer persecution. Hmm. 
Another companion verse for that is Philippians 1.29. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on Him, you know I did that, but also to suffer for His sake. Oh. I don't want that. Let this mind be in you which also was in Christ Jesus. He humbled Himself. He took on the form of a servant. God did that for you. And we're not God. Isn't it a reasonable service? To humble ourselves and suffer for His sake? You ever read Paul's best life now? 2 Corinthians 11? That's a fun read. This didn't make it into Joel Osteen's book, but it's Bible. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 11. Well, we can start around verse 20 something here. Let's see. Oh, 24. Yeah, 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians 11. Just read through a few of these. Oh, thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I've been in the deep, and journeyings often in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils in mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the cities. Peril Sounds like the guy knows what he's talking about. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Oh, and then there was the weariness and painfulness in verse 27. Watchings often, hunger and thirst, and fastings. He wasn't trying to be spiritual, folks. He was fasting because there was no food. Cold and nakedness. That's a different situation than what God promised to Israel, wasn't it? You have your worst enemy giving his life now to serve you, to serve Christ, and he has all that trouble. But you know what? Nothing can separate, he knew nothing can separate him from the love of God. Amen. That's something we need to know by faith, and that's something we can hang on to that's a faithful saying, you know it because the Bible told you so. Yes, I'm having a bad day. Yes, an awful thing happened to me. Yes, it's a bad circumstance, but I know that it's not God beating me up because He's already crucified my flesh. I know that although I may suffer, although I may be dying, I will live with Him and I will reign with Him. I didn't sign up for that. Well, that's why you have verses that say, Endure hardness. Be a good soldier. Finally, you know what it means when a preacher says finally? <laughs> Hour or two left. <laughs> no, re you read it in the Bible. You see somebody say amen? The book doesn't end for four chapters. They just keep going and go. Titus, please. We'll finish up. Titus chapter 3. Maintain. Titus 3 8. This is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly. <laughs> that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Anybody can do good for a week, right? I've been at it a month. I'm going strong. You know what? Your flesh knocks on your door. I'm not dead yet. Time to serve me a little. Time to please me a little. Maintain. You know what that means? It's a given that you should be operating in good works, isn't it? <sighs> K. 
careful to maintain good works. It's important to understand, too, your lifestyle is not the gospel. But your lifestyle should be adorning the gospel. You know what the concept of adorning is? Women adorn themselves with jewelry. That's what we should be, our lives should be adorning the gospel with pleasing things, good things to look at. You ever have a memory in your life of a time where your behavior was awful? And you made terrible choices, and you know that the person you that made those terrible choices for, for is not saved. And of anybody on the planet to tell them the gospel, they wouldn't listen to you. That's a problem. That's things we need to put behind us. Not be that anymore. Not do that. Careful to maintain good works. It's called another passage, pressing on. When you think of the concept of pressing on, if you're receiving pressure, you're receiving resistance, right? It's so easy to stop resisting. But it's a faithful saying that they which believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. And your circumstances aren't going to get any better. Look at... Uh, Oops, I didn't have the reference down there. This is in there somewhere. <laughs> I didn't type out the reference. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. We must maintain and stand fast in the good works. It says, continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Don't quit. Keep pressing. Keep working. It's so easy to stop. You hand out 20 gospel tracts or tell 20 people the gospel and you get 20 rejections. Well, I tried. I'm not going to do that anymore. No! Faithful saying! Maintain! <laughs> Keep at it. Keep doing it. We can't quit. Who else is going to do the job? Let's look at 2 Corinthians real quick and we'll be done. 2 Corinthians 5. Why do I have to maintain? Why do I have to keep going? Why do I have to keep pressing? Our, another passage in Philippians calls it your conversation. And when the Bible uses the word conversation, it's not necessarily referring to you and me yakking back and forth. Your conversation is your manner of life. And it says, let your conversation be becoming the gospel. You know what conduct unbecoming is? Our conduct should be becoming. Why do I have to keep pressing on? Why do I have to keep at it, keep working? 2 Corinthians 5, look at verse 19. Start at verse 18. 18, God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, amen, amen, amen. We talked about that in faithful saying number one. And hath done what? Given us a job. How did you get saved? Did God come down and meet you on the road to Cleveland? No. You got saved because you heard the gospel from somebody who was maintaining and pressing on and doing the good works. That's how you got saved. God hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. Whoa. And all things are of God, who hath or to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto me. 
Why do I have to maintain? Why do I have to keep going? Who else is going to do it? If not you, who? The unsaved people, they're going to preach the gospel? Remember, the only thing that you can take with you, people, to God's glory. So that's the four faithful sayings. If you're disillusioned with your society, with your government, with your family, with your friends, with church experience, you got these four things. You know you can bank on that and trust that. Christ came to save sinners, that's faithful. Godliness is profitable, that's faithful. If we dead with Him, we'll live with Him. If we suffer, we'll reign with Him, that's, pro or that's faithful. And it's always good to maintain good works. That's faithful. Remember that when, next time somebody tells you to quit. It's not working, just quit. Just stop. Hold on, wait. That's not a faithful saying, is it? All right, that's all I had today. I already see a hand going up. Yes, Ted.